Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tim Richards, Technical Services Manager of the Managing General Agents Association. And on behalf of the NGAA, I'd like to welcome you to our briefing this afternoon. This is being delivered by Brown Jacobson on the subject of governance, preventing personal liability for board members. Before I introduce our presenters, I'd just like to run through a few housekeeping points. Please ensure your microphone and camera are turned off. If you'd like to ask a question, feel free to use the chat button at the bottom of your screen. Time allowing, these will be asked and answered at the end of the events. If we run out of time, questions will be answered post events. This session does include polls, just to reassure you that these are anonymous. This presentation is accredited that CPD hours is relevant to your ongoing professional development program. The briefing is being recorded. Our link to the recording will be issued post event together with the slides and our feedback survey. Please take the time to complete our survey. It will take no longer than two minutes and it allows us to deliver the best possible future events to our membership. So as a recap, today's briefing is on the subject of governance, preventing personal liability for board members from Brown Jacobson. So let me introduce you to our presenters, Jeremy Irving and Tom Morell. Jeremy has worked extensively on governance issues in the insurance markets, and these issues link to the FCA's recent consumer duty and operational resilience initiatives, and to ESG board effectiveness more broadly. Jeremy also has wide expertise in regulatory supervision, notifications, whistleblowing, investigations and enforcement on conduct, governance and prevention matters for NGAs, and the insurance markets more generally. Tom has previously worked for the FCA, getting a wealth of experience acting on significant financial crime and regulatory enforcement cases. His work with insurers and NGAs includes advice on ESG issues related to board effectiveness and consumer duty, and on complex professional indemnity insurance litigation. Tom has also advised clients on the alignment of governance processes with FCA rules and reporting and notification of the breaches. So without further ado, enjoy the briefing, everyone, and Jeremy, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Tim, uh, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, we join you um, through the magic of Zoom. Um, you may have spotted that uh, my colleague Tom and I are in separate locations, and that is, um, on, at least on my part, through the less than magic of Greater Anglia Rail. Uh, um, next uh, slide, please, Tom. Uh, so this is the uh, little bio intro uh, for me and Tom. Um, I should say that uh, we're going to be going for about 45 to 50 minutes. We've got a, uh, a wealth of material uh, to talk about with you. Um, happy to take questions at the end, or indeed you can you drop them, I think, into the uh, chat function. Uh, and I think Tim um, will be able to pick them up and, and share them. Um, and obviously Tom and I would be delighted to have calls or receive emails if people want to raise questions um, uh, uh, after this event. Uh, next slide, please, Tom. So um, these are the learning objectives as uh, 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 advertised, which um, brought such a, uh, a, a welcome large audience um, to today's seminar. So we're going to be looking at legal and regulatory obligations and risk, uh, particularly for uh, MGA board members. Uh, we're going to look at the ways in which um, those obligations can be met and to prevent or reduce exposure to risk around these sorts of obligations. And then we're going to summarize the ways in which those risks can be mitigated. Uh, next slide, please, Tom. So we're going to do this in uh, three parts. And as you can see, uh, each of the first two parts has a, a focus on the Companies Act and the Financial Services and Markets Act. Um, we're going to look at the overall framework for um, duties. And we're going to look at uh, key risk indicators, directions of travel uh, and um, indicators of trends in the second part. And then in the third part, we're going to look at the prevention and risk management piece and we're going to talk a little bit about um, some aspects of DNO. Next slide please Tom. Now if you forget everything else that we say uh, in this session um, this is the slide to remember or keep a copy of or take a photo of however you want to do it uh, and really summarizes what we're trying to do uh, in, in the next 45 minutes or so. 
we're going to try and give you practical examples in order to illustrate what might otherwise appear to be quite uh, abstract concepts, you know, very legalistic, very wordy. We're going to try and highlight similarities between the General Corporate Companies Act regime, which is the uh, original, if you will, the fundamental, the foundation legislation around director's duties, and the Financial Services and Markets Act, which is a, a separate but related layer. Um, we're going to highlight that, that each of those have discrete, they are, there are discrete obligations, they're discrete pieces of legislation, but there is enough in each of them that really complying with one will take you a long way towards complying with the other. Um, and the, the, the converse of that is that uh, risks that arise under one, and this is, will come up more when we look at the trends, will start to feed through to the others as opposed to fee through to the others. Um, and the big message, the big message is prevention is better than cure. And actually, prevention is quite a long way better than even mitigation. How to approach the rules, how to approach policies and procedures. Yes, they create risk from the risk of breach or, or non-compliance, but actually seeking to comply and having effective systems and controls towards compliance gives you your protection. So in many ways, it is helpful to think of the rules and the statutory requirements and the regulatory provisions as your friend. Next slide, please, Tom. So I think this is over to me. Thank you, Jeremy, and um, welcome, everybody. So before we get into the weeds of the trends and how some of those preventative actions can be taken, let's have a little look, look at the framework, which um, just to get everybody on an even keel um, so that we're all up to date. So directors' duties. Directors have fiduciary duties for their company to act in the best interests of their company. It's very similar to the responsibilities held by trustees of a will or a trust that you may well otherwise be involved with, um, although their legal frameworks are slightly different. It applies to directors, both those listed on companies' house as directors and those who aren't, whether they be de facto directors or shadow directors. So that's worth considering for your business as well. It's also really important that we say, as outlined at the very top of the, the, the PowerPoint slide here, that this relates to all decisions made by directors. These duties are omnipresent and it's not solely decisions made at board meetings that this relates to. So let's get started with the first um, duty here. We're going to run through these pretty quickly. And if you'd like any further detail on this, please feel free to reach out to us after the event. The first um, section 171 of the Companies Act 2006 requires um, directors to act within the powers provided to them by the company. This is effectively not exercising powers which you don't have authority to provide. For example, not abiding by special resolutions of the company, making unlawful distributions or influencing the outcome of a general meeting. This is commonly the case for smaller companies, but can also affect larger um, entities as well. Section 172, and probably the most, the most fundamental uh, director's duty and most difficult to grapple with, we'll be touching on in a bit more detail in the next slide, but it's worth drawing your attention to the main case around this, which is the Client Earth versus Shell litigation, which finished last year. You may have been aware of this in the press, that um, 27 shares were bought by the environmental action group Client Earth in Shell, and they sought to bring a derivative action, a shareholder action against the directors of Shell for their lack of or perceived lack of movement on environmental goals set out in their policy. Although it's not an insurance case, it's really important for understanding those duties. And we'll come on to that in a moment. But next, 173, the exercise of independent judgment. Now, when we're looking at this, you've got to think of the director being there. The director is in post, sorry, to exercise their independent thought on advice they receive. It is absolutely fine for a director to rely on the advice they've received as long as it's their independent choice to use or follow that advice. They're using their judgment. Now, this is really reflecting how it's a breach of such a duty would be around if there was a stooge director imposed um, for, for the will of a particular shareholder. That's the sort of level we're looking at. In independent judgment relates to if you follow advice, as long as you have reason to do so. Next down is uh, exercising reasonable skill, care and diligence. This is a really quite demanding test on particularly some of the more um, experienced members on this call. Um, 
the standard is very high. There are two standards, an objective and subjective standard. The first objective standard is to be a reasonably diligent director um, of the knowledge, skill and experience reasonably expected of the person holding that role. So therefore, that is the standard set. However, if you are particularly experienced or you have special skills, that bar is raised through your subjective standard to the, to the knowledge, skill and experience that that director or you actually have. So it's always worth considering what special abilities do you have, um, which may well raise the bar of your responsibilities beyond those of those that you work with. And next, onto 175, avoiding, avoiding conflicts of interest. We're going to push through these last three quite quickly um, because they, they, they should be quite clear to you. But avoiding conflicts of interest, there are duties owed to the company um, and the, the actions of a director need to be separate to those of the interests of the individual or a third party that they may or may not represent. It's well worth considering this, particularly if you have multiple directorships, you're, you're a NED in another company, um, you manage your shareholdings directly. So if you have a particular interest in Facebook and your company is doing some work with Facebook, that might be a conflict of interest. You need to get authorised in advance. However, a conflict wouldn't be the case if it's authorised by the board in advance of an opportunity coming around. Section 176, um, not accepting benefits from third parties. This is looking to prohibit the exploitation of your position for the benefit of yourself. So the key to this is um, frankness, taking a fiduciary approach uh, on the part of the directors. Um, now, we, uh, Tom flagged up previously that we were going to um, look at the uh, Section 172. Uh, and this is really the key to directors. And this was the piece that was explored most recently in the Client Earth uh, case. Um, so the th what directors must do, they must consider in good faith, and this is a crucial phrase, what would be most likely to promote the success of the company, having regard to likely consequences of any decision, interests of the company's employees, need to foster the company's business relationships, impact of the operations on the community and the environment. This is going to be an important um, statutory piece going forward, particularly with ESG activism. Desirability of the company maintaining a reputation for high standards of business conduct and the need to act fairly as between members of the company. So just some practical thoughts for you around this. Likely consequences of a decision. M&A can often be a flashpoint for this. And so the duties on the directors to think about the consequences in the longer term, not just whether in the short term, in the immediate term, a particular offer is a good idea, is going to give some short term boost to the share price, for instance. The director's report or the strategic report depending on the size of your business its financial uh, uh, and certain other dimensions um, that will tackle that should tackle the the way that the directors articulate how they've made decisions in the interest of the company's employees and similarly how business relationships uh, are being fostered um, I've mentioned already the importance of D in terms of an ESG uh, proposition, and I'll come back to this point later on. Maintaining high standards. This could also be linked in with ESG considerations, possibly um, not only in terms of climate and carbon, etc., but also the reputation uh, around social issues, EDI, of particular relevance at the moment. And again, I'll come on, on to that in a little bit. And the need to act fairly as between members of the company, the members, the shareholders should be taken as a whole. So it's not just about particular directors who may be linked to particular shareholders pushing their interests. Each director must consider the interests of all of the shareholders as a whole. Um, in terms of just a liability point, that final bullet point there at the bottom, uh, in relation to strategic reporting rules, they are enforceable on a criminal basis, which is something of an exception for the overall piece around uh, enforcement of liabilities under the Companies Act. 
And this is that general proposition. Duties uh, for directors are really owed to the, to the company as a whole, but they are enforceable by the company, and they are enforceable by the company, or importantly, by specific shareholders. Uh, and this is dealt with under uh, Section 260, the um, provision as to derivative claims, uh, and the wealth of opportunity potentially creates for shareholders to bring claims against directors individually. This was very much explored and exploited, or sought to be exploited, uh, by Client Earth. They managed to buy 27 shares, 0.1.7% of Shell's overall shareholding. Uh, and they made allegations about failures on the part of the directors under what Section 172 and Section 174 for not, in a, in a nutshell, for not taking account, sufficient account, uh, of um, climate risk within uh, actions taken by the company. And what Client Earth did is they sought declaratory and uh, injunctive action. So they wanted um, the court to order that Shell's director should stop doing certain things or should do certain things and, and seek a declaration. Now, you may say, well, that's that's not like being sued for damages. That doesn't really bother me too much. But of course, it's the costs, it's the legal cost piece is an area of loss, which is particularly important in these circumstances. And that will bring us on to the DNO considerations toward the end of the presentation. So um, briefly now talking about uh, SMCR, I imagine quite a lot of you are familiar with this. Um, appreciate that some MGA members might be um, persons appointed representatives, but I imagine a lot of you are authorised firms uh, uh, and well versed in, in SMCR. But again, when we look at the duties under SMCR in COCON, very similar standards, similar but not identical. A key factor is around openness and cooperation with the FCA. That, that degree of openness is not really something which goes on uh, explicitly within the co companies acting the same way, although it does not cut across the fiduciary obligations that arise as a matter of common law. But from uh, for those of you who are, who are directors, senior management, uh, senior management function holders, it, it's these pieces which are, should be of particular concern, sort of uppermost on your mind, and compliance with these will help you comply more generally. Um, other requirements, effective control, um, compliance with regulatory standards, etc., effective delegation, liaison with the, with the uh, FCA or PRA is appropriate. Um, so just to sort of break up the, 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 the monologue, uh, I'm... Um, we're going to run a quick poll here. Tim, are you still in a position to do that with the... Um, Certainly can, Jeremy. Yep, I'll launch that now. So the yes, question we we're asking is, uh, how focused are your directors on personal liability from the Companies Act or indeed from FISNA? So how focused are the directors of your firms on their personal liability? If people just want to uh, answer that question. Well, we've got some... So yes, uh, apologies for for dropping off there by mistake. Um, there we go. Um, we, we're back back alive and up now. But um, an interesting outcome here appears. Just over half of those people are saying that there's somewhat directors are somewhat focused on the Companies Act personal sure. liability. Clear leader. So look, version one that's in there. Um... Yeah, close that. Yeah, clearly. So, that, yeah. so again, picking up with Tom, obviously having a very day with the wife. Eh? Um, uh, clearly, that's the start prudent position to take. Um, and key to it is, of course, uh, is of course the, the ability to manage. It's about proportionality in binds so that people do not become high bound, fearful, and capable of actually making decisions and be effective as a leadership unit, uh, individual leaders' leadership unit, by themselves and about their uh, personal. And um, to bear out what I said at the start of this presentation, actually by complying with the relevant rules 
as to, to what the FCA requires into leadership, that will make you sufficiently effective and avoid liability. OK, um, moving on. So current trends. Um, thanks, Tom or Tim. Perhaps, is, is that... Um, has the poll come away from everybody's vision? It you has. Still see my it is still on your screen, Jeremy. You can just close it, but it uh, should have come off everyone, else, everyone else's screen. Fine. Great. Uh, okay. So, um, current current trends. So the big news, obviously, which will have reached many of you, if not all of you, around this individual liability piece, non-financial misconduct. Uh, very important step forward by the FCA uh, from its um, notice to provide information, and there's a web link in the slides to that. Um, bullying, discrimination, and harassment is the usual formulation around non-financial misconduct, but actually the, the survey asking for in, in includes other factors as well. Um, what is interesting, I think, uh, from a legal perspective and in terms of this concept, that we're talking about of the the twin tracks of Companies Act and Financial Services and Markets Act is the the fact that a director has a duty under the Companies Act to consider the interests of employees and there's an interesting question the sort of thing that lawyers love to love to ponder on and even more argue about is um, actually whether a failure to comply with regulatory duties around dealing appropriately with complaints about uh, improper conduct by directors failing to record uh, the information, failing to resolve the issues, really failing to report, to report things correctly to the FCA, whether that would actually cut across the duty that the directors owe to consider the interests of their employees. In other words, if it is a, 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 an unsuitable environment with a poor culture which does not generate or engender psychological safety, uh, etc., and doesn't allow you to speak up and, and manage risks effectively, then um, that could actually be, uh, amongst other things, prejudicial to employees. Um, also in the news at the moment, premium finance, um, again, perhaps classically, this was often seen as uh, sort of the the concepts of mis-selling, etc., were often seen as uh, financial misconduct because of financial outcomes. Um, but actually, those financial outcomes tend on having uh, more personal um, engagement, uh, dealings with customers, uh, sales efforts, marketing efforts, uh, incentivization of um, workforce personnel, etc. So something which might appear just to be a, a financial consideration, actually the two go hand in hand, financial and non-financial. Um, we have um, a, a point here around the FCA's enforcement appetite. That's actually um, been on quite sort of substantial display recently. And Tom, if you have the connection, are you, do you want to elaborate on this? Because I know this is something that you've looked at, at least in your f formal life. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, thank you. And apologies for any connection issues we, we do have. Um, I think it's really interesting, the FCA's recent appetite to fine individuals, particularly around issues where there is key market intervention from the FCA. Um, one particular example can be the defined benefit pension cases around the British Steel Pension Scheme, um, mis-selling. A lot of these firms have gone insolvent and therefore issues with redress um, are being dealt with through those insolvency routes. However, there is still a massive focus on individuals. There's been recent um, uh, final notices delivered against Mark Abley and Paul Steele, as well as Andrew Page back in 2022 um, for their pension transfer advice. Now, for the insurance market, it might be worth considering other FCA interventions, for example, on gap finance and also non-financial misconduct and how this might, how this increased focus on individual culpability might be seen for the insurance lens. Thanks, Tom. Um, further issues which are going to which are either driving current trends or going to I think start trends will be um, greenwashing uh, the FCA's and, and indeed the PRA's very heavy focus uh, on sustainability uh, and um, that is going to become increasing I think the responsibility of individual directors and the FCA will expect to see um, good conduct from individuals 
uh, around these sorts of issues. Um, linked to that uh, is the consumer duty. Key factor there, uh, amongst other things, is the um, annual report, uh, which is required, and that's um, at the end of July. Uh, so definitely worth thinking about very carefully uh, as individual directors, as part of the governing body, the board uh, as a whole. Uh, similarly, um, some firms may have chosen to um, take on board their board champion for the consumer duty. Others may not have done so. The important thing is to, uh, whatever decision is made, it's, uh, there's an important rationalisation uh, of why it should happen or will not happen. Um, finally, operational resilience, perhaps less of an issue for uh, the intermediary sector, such as for uh, MGAs, um, but the you may feel as uh, product distributors, perhaps in some cases even manufacturers, um, you may feel some uh, heat, some demands for information, etc., uh, from uh, your uh, uh, from insurers. Uh, again, looking to identify individuals with specific responsibilities and accountability. Uh, so, Tom's already highlighted that there's been a recent raft of um, individual action, actions against individuals um, in the FS space. Um, to go back to for the insurance market, you have to go back a few years um, to, to look at individual actions. Uh, and again, I'm going to exclude issues around PPI and I'm going to exclude issues around um, dishonesty. Um, and really try and focus on operational issues where individual directors were held uh, accountable. Uh, you may well say at this stage, you know, it's a few years ago, surely time has gone. It, there was a smudge of it between uh, roughly 2014 through to roughly 2018. It's gone a bit quiet. Uh, that's not an unreasonable thing to say. Of course, the other way to look at it is to say, actually, if we're thinking in terms of cycles, Maybe things are coming back round to the insurance market again, and maybe uh, an indicator of that is the recent demand for Section 165 in respect of non-financial misconduct. So moving along with these, um, just a quick summary for you with the um, PCF piece. This is the Swinton case uh, and cases, Mrs. Bowyer, Claire and Halpin. That was the, um, let's say, efficient commercial strategy around the sale of add-ons, which the FCA found to be uh, mis-selling. Um, again, the sections in orange that I've got here, the little banners under each of these uh, points, they're to try and highlight this potential tie-up with section 172. Uh, so I won't read those out, but you can cross-refer them and you can Again, a general idea is how these things can become linked and how activist shareholders could exploit the Companies Act piece in order to put further pressure on individual directors, perhaps preventing regulatory action. Uh, in the case of Mr. Phillips, the next bullet point down, uh, that was a failure to follow uh, his own firm's policies and procedures on financial matters. Uh, and finally, Mr. Radford, um, that was a finding that um, he did not sufficiently understand the relevant regulatory rules. So just to give you a bit more detail and a bit more context, again, with the idea of trying to make this just a little bit more practical. Um, in the case of Mr. Bowyer, the key finding uh, that led to his personal liability uh, was that he prioritised sales over the fair treatment of customers. And obviously that has very considerable resonance uh, in this era of the consumer duty. Uh, Mr. Clare, who was in charge of compliance, failed to identify that uh, there were potential issues, that were there, there were, in effect, challenges and conflicts between the sales proposition, the sales strategy, and the customer treatment strategy. And um, Mr. Halpin, who is the uh, CEO, he uh, failed to make sure that management information coming to the board reflected all the relevant information, not just excellent sales figures for add-ons, but also customer feedback, customer experience, and so forth. 
in terms of practical issues or indications of liability, illustrations, very chunky six-figure fines and bans from operating uh, at a senior level within the financial services market. Similarly, on Philip, um, this was the Towergate um, matter, again, to highlight the concept that it's certainly a, a, a regulatory pattern to take enforcement action against the corporate entity and individual directors. One does not exclude the other. Uh, this was about the use of client money. And um, what we have here is obviously uh, would appear to be sort of pressure to uh, maintain cash flows uh, based on accounting arrangements, financial arrangements within a group. Uh, and Mr. Philip failed to adhere to the company's own policies and procedures around the protection of client money. Again, a chunky fine and a ban. Mr. Radford, a very similar story, actually, in a lot of ways, getting a lot of money in to a great extent by selling multi-year policies and then using that extra money after the premium uh, to be um, to be invested capital to grow the business. Um, again, it's that pressure between corporate action, corporate obligations and regulatory requirements. Uh, very substantial fine uh, and similarly a ban. Now, spoiler alert, obviously regulatory fines are not covered by um, DNO or indeed other insurance. So the key here when you're thinking about mitigation uh, is thinking about the legal costs and how that can be potentially helped through uh, DNO or perhaps other insurance. Um, but the, fi the prim primary point is, of course, prevention. Know your firm's policies and procedures, stick to them, know the regulatory rules. If you're clear, make sure you're getting advice from your uh, in-house compliance advisors, your risk unit, your legal unit, and if necessary, obviously, your external uh, independent lawyers. So, um, again, just to break things up a little bit, uh, we have a poll here. Uh, again, Tim, if you're okay to run this, if I can ask people to think about the level of confidence that they have that they team bill of health. So it looks quite like uh, people are quite confident in, in their clean bill of health um, with nearly tied, actually very much tied now, but um, highly confident and somewhat confident being factoring for around about 90% of, of, of those responses. So thank you very much. That's, that's, that's good to hear. Thank you. Right. All right, moving on. So we're now getting into the third section of the of the presentation. Uh, risk management and prevention or risk prevention and management. So key flashpoints. Uh, I've already mentioned M&A, corporate reorganizations. Another classic flashpoint, which also brings in other areas of law, which again, there isn't really time to, to get into, particularly the, the, the law and insolvency, will be situations where directors are faced with challenging financial scenarios for their companies. Um, increasingly, there is a trend towards uh, aggressive treatment of public announcements, um, particularly public announcements based on ESG, climate carbon, uh, and so forth. And this is um, this was a feature of the client earth action. But other public announcements um, could also stimulate action uh, and individual liability through uh, uh, the way sign-off processes may have worked or indeed not worked. Um, another piece, again, I've touched on the non-financial misconduct area, but um, individual liability around the way 
um, employment law HR issues are addressed, this can be a significant area. And I suspect that the FCA's demand for information may re well reveal more around this. Uh, individual liability and accountability around regulatory interactions. This would include uh, applications for new recruits under SMCR uh, or changes, motions um, to SIMF level, uh, and indeed um, sign offs on uh, recruitment, personal involvement in recruitment, particularly of individuals who may, in due course, uh, come to find they have. Uh, challenges uh, as to their suitability, their fitness and propriety, particularly if it relates to uh, legacy matters which were not uh, unearthed or not sufficiently addressed during the recruitment process. Um, responding to information requests is a key area. Dealing with responding to cooperating as appropriate with uh, regulatory uh, and also internal investigations. Um, other areas which are likely to prove, um, key, which are indeed key risk areas in terms of individual accountability, will be notifications to the regulator, maintaining the open and cooperative relationship using print 11 uh, and obviously the more drastic circumstances which tend to be, uh, which are addressed within SUP 153. And in terms of managing that liability, preventing that liability, I should say, the essential questions that each individual director and the directors collectively need to be asking themselves is what decisions are they, have they made? Are they due to make? Are they in the process of making? What, in what circumstances pertaining to what? And with what ramifications? What information and advice have the directors taken? Have they been thorough enough and clear enough in, their, in forming their understanding as directors of what is germane to making the decision and therefore what the decision should be? And thirdly, and this is a, a more nuanced area which is less easily uh, circumscribed in writing, but the way that the directors interact in order to make decisions. So classic uh, risk areas which um, can often arise in terms of skilled persons reports in, or, or board effectiveness reviews and so forth is uh, whether a board meeting itself or committee, the operation of governance structures and committees are effective environments for making decisions. So practical things. Has everybody read the board pack? Is a board pack um, comprehensible? Is it digestible? Have people referred to it when making decisions? Are people sticking to agendas? Are people um, engaged? Are directors actually engaged in decision making? Are they over engaged? Are they over enthusiastic? Are they talking across each other? Are there is there one or more directors who are, in, in words used by the FCA in, uh, uh, in uh, analysis, it about ten years ago in this area, over mighty, and therefore browbeating others around the making of decisions. So that interpersonal dynamic is very important. Is important as uh, what appears on the written evidence. So thinking about evidence and thinking about practicalities when we're looking at prevention and management. We've already talked about company constitutional documents and not straying beyond the bounds of those company constitutional documents. Often they will be fairly broadly drawn, but in some cases there could be agreements in place which um, limit what certain directors can and can't do, what they can and can't say, uh, or indeed put particular onus on them. So it's very, it's very important 
that somebody who is a director throughout their career and their time as that director is very familiar with what their company constitutional documents have to say about their role as a director. Policies and procedures, absolutely essential. You saw the issue with um, there with Mr. Philip on the Towergate case. Um, very important that people are, the directors are aware of what their company's position has already been worked out as being on a particular issue on the way of managing a particular operational factor. This brings us on to a particularly challenging area, I think, uh, uh, in terms of both compliance, governance and, and, and legal advice, which is minutes, how to deal with minutes. We know there are trends in certain jurisdictions where the minutes are kept to an absolute, the most bare, sparse minimum possible. But actually, probably the trend in the UK is going to be towards better and fuller minutes. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that minutes must be the same as a verbatim record. Uh, and they indeed might not be helpful and could even give potentially the, uh, the wrong impression. But it will certainly be advantageous for directors to think when they're addressing certain issues um, that it is prudent that the depth of their assessment of matters, the detail of what they've considered, is spelt out in the minutes. And I think that's it's difficult to sort of put it any more narrowly than that. I've certainly dealt with situations where um, the, 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 the minutes, which also reflected sort of the agenda, the ref terms of reference, if you will, for a particular meeting, uh, very clearly spelt out what the legal issues were intended to be in relation to the decision made in that meeting. And that was a very effective risk management uh, mechanism that same company uh, later on um, did not follow that same action uh, uh, and actually then ran into some difficulty um, in terms of trying to justify a decision that was made. Um, board papers I've talked about uh, already, key co concepts there. Relevance, clarity, comprehensiveness, digestibility. Again, in the minute, should you be referring, just taking as read that the, the board packs have been read, or should you actually be citing or quoting pieces? The answer to that is it will depend on the particular circumstances and the appraisal of risk that has gone on in relation to any given issue that needs to be decided upon. Sticking to agendas, very important, or there needs to be an explanation in the minutes as to why that was not done. Legal advice and privilege, an obvious point perhaps to, to, to be made by a lawyer, but boards, individual directors need to think very carefully when they take their legal advice, how they deploy in-house counsel, how they deploy external counsel, what things need to be kept as privileged, how the interaction between the unprivileged and the privileged parts of board meetings and others, uh, other such meetings are addressed. And I know Tom said at the start quietly, Directors' duties apply throughout the life of the directorship appointment. But the board meetings and committee meetings, by extension, are very much uh, the forum, the crucible for what, for the quality of decision making and the adherence to the duties under the Companies Act and the duties uh, under FISMA. Uh, and I've finally on this slide, I've already mentioned the potential advantages in having board effectiveness reviews or governance behavioural reviews that are badged in different ways uh, or audits as to the way that decisions are, are made at board level and therefore as part of a preventative and risk management exercise in that respect for directors to have the mirror shown to them held up to them uh, and to, if necessary, improve or enhance the way they operate and perform. And that is obviously going to, we should make life better for them in the longer run. So in the next um, few 
few minutes or so, I'm just going to talk a bit about DNO now. I appreciate a number of people on this call will probably be specialists in DNO insurance, and certainly my aim is not to teach any of my um, metaphorical grandparents anything in that respect. Um, but I think that for many businesses, uh, and this may also be true in the insurance market on the on the basis that the uh, the cobbler's children, etc., going unshod, is that often a DNO can be overlooked. So it's worth considering some fundamentals for DNO as that risk mitigant, as a part of an active part of an overall approach to risk management and part of an act risk management program for directors liabilities as well as company liabilities um classic sort of formulation of uh defined terms here what is loss who is actually the insured directors plus offices plus others offices plus others um what is a claim what is the wrongful act how does it respond um, and what is it included or not included in loss? Again, a reminder of uh, the way exclusions can work around what is covered, the way that certainly regulatory rules work around what can or can't be covered. But the key to it being in terms of personal liability, it is the cover for legal expense in addressing, in the process of addressing these issues. Um, further points on DNO. So, what are the trends which we as lawyers are seeing? So, ESG shareholder activism absolutely crucial in in pushing more and more at directors' personal liability. Client Earth have have made no secret that they plan to use the learnings from their otherwise failed action against Shell uh, in terms of pursuing further and other actions and there'll be other activist groups who will be in a similar position and actually potentially uh, individual shareholders could also take such an approach cyber again not teaching any of my metaphorical grandparents there'll be lots of specialists on cyber here but it is a major and constantly growing area of risk and the ability to manage risks around cyber is, is fundamental for boards and, and therefore for individual directors. Uh, the growing cost of regulatory investigations. This is another key area. It is linked to data. It is linked to the amount of material that exists. It is linked to uh, interviewing witnesses. It is linked to the breadth and range of issues that regulators want to explore. Um, Again, it is linked to this concept that it often a director's personal liability won't necessarily always be the end result of the legal uh, remedy or the regulatory sanction, but the sheer cost of protecting themselves and having legal representation and advice. I've already mentioned this concept of use of DNO as an integrated part of a risk management program, not just something which needs to be bought once a year, you know, a form filled in, renewed, whatever it might be, bought once a year, put into a drawer and ignored. It needs to be a treated as a living document, part of a living program. Does everybody who's covered by it understand it? Have they, do they have access to it? Have they read it? There's an interesting compliance question as to whether actually firms should be checking that that is the position as part of their overall duty under section 1721B to their employees. Um, don't ask, don't get. This was a point put to me um, by an underwriter of, of DNO. Uh, and um, it's very important that people really look at and think about the wordings that are proffered questions around exclusions, conditions, precedent. Are these things relevant to the MGA, to the directors and MGA as a purchaser? 
potentially uh, 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 as a consumer or at least a form of consumer or customer. It's again as part of this concept of the living the living arrangement involving Dino and risk management as a living program. Um, there is an engagement piece here which can be very advantageous both in terms of the underwriting stage and the claim stage and obviously as uh, lawyers we, we tend to see more around the claims piece but not exclusively. Um, what are underwriters looking for? Well as it's been explained to me by um, specialist underwriters uh, in, in, including um, a, a member of the MGAA. Green flags is a key concept for them. Can they see that the board is active and that it's proactive uh, uh, and, and that directors are, are looking to deal with things and not just sitting back and waiting for something to go wrong? Has there been credible independent valid, validation of the board's effectiveness? That can be very important and helpful. And then green flags on the claim. Has it been done on a timely basis? Is there clarity in the communications from the claims manager's perspective, claims unit's perspective? And again, proactivity. Dealing with the insurer, dealing with the uh, whoever has the authority to handle the claim, making sure that the cons any consents that are needed are appropriate attained. So our final poll of this session, a very exciting one but perhaps uh, will be uh, could produce some interesting results. How many of you have had your DNO cover? It's uh, good. Oh, currently sitting at 50-50. So um, I'll say that's, mu that's much higher than, um, than, than we were expecting. So that's fantastic news, um, particularly as insurers. Uh, in the insurance market, sorry. So yeah, just just over a half, so fifty five percent say that they haven't, and forty five say that they have. Not bad at all. Very good. All right, that is interesting. Um. Okay, so wrapping up now. Um, it won't surprise you to learn that Tom and I uh, have done some preparation around um, helping, potentially helping people uh, with any issues they might face in this regard. Uh, and so details, uh, our further contact details and a reminder of what we look like is on this slide, plus a little summary of specific areas where we can help, uh, particularly around board effectiveness. And again, the learning objectives, which uh, obviously I very much hope um, have been achieved so that you're going out of this uh, seminar, um, you'll be able to explain the legal and regulatory obligations and risks, outline how you can prevent and reduce exposure, uh, and summarize how you can deal with mitigation. So thank you all very much for attending and for staying with us. I've not noticed any um, a, a, a raft of digital exits from the event. Uh, so we're happy we've got a couple of minutes left and we're happy to take any questions. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, we do have uh, one question, which I think we can just about fit in. Um, so the example, the examples given from the examples given, I think this is going back about 15 minutes. Uh, it appears the roles held by Towergate and OneCall were in an appointed representative role. Any impact on their principles? So the... Um... Ah, I think that could be the, was was there a re reference there to uh, a, you know, no, actually the tight, um, at one with, uh, so that's why the, um, those particular uh, sanctions were brought against those particular ind individuals. But this is a very good question and actually potentially um, a, a, an idea for a whole new seminar. That is absolutely the case that a failure to um, to oversee appointed representatives to have sufficient systems and controls in place, not just limited to a contract, and of course a lot will turn on the contract, 
um, but actually uh, to, to treat the relationship as a living thing, to extend my analogy around the um, uh, risk management program, is, is fundamental. And so individual directors could, could easily find themselves liable for things done or not done by appointed representatives. So the whole concept of management of distribution, the exposure around the consumer duty, potentially issues around operational resilience, all these things feed into uh, ultimately the effect of the board and the um, and individual director. Really good, point. It's really interesting pick, and, and I'd be delighted to do do another session on it. Um, we've just had one comment actually, uh, Jeremy, uh, just saying they'd be very interested in, in a seminar around IARs and ARs. Um, so I'll just leave you with that thought. And uh, unfortunately, we're right out of time, but also right out of um, questions. So thank you very much, Jeremy. Um, just to read one other comment there. Thank you, Jeremy and Tom. Very interesting and useful training session, which I think sums it up. So thanks from me as well for your briefing today, both. And uh, I'm sure everyone will agree that it's been very engaging. Um, as you'll have seen from that last slide, you can reach Brown Jacobson at the contact details shown, or feel free to contact me at tim.richards at mgaa.co.uk with any questions or introductions, and I'll be happy to pass these on. Thanks also for joining us. Please don't forget to provide your feedback and do look out for forthcoming MGAA events. Hope you all have a produ productive afternoon. Thanks again for joining us and see you all soon. Thanks both. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks. Bye-bye.